Now let's talk about trading. Not just trading in the sense of speculating um, price movement of certain coins, but how blockchain technology and tokenized digital assets may impact the operational process and capital efficiency in trading. So first of all, I'd like to have our panelists give the audience an overview of what your company does and share any product updates. Uh, let's start with you, Daniel. Okay, great. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Daniel Sosoronsky. I am the GM of Fabric of Fame. Uh, Fabric is a global digital financial service ecosystem with five core businesses. Uh, the first one is our multi asset portfolio. The second is our basically our market division, which includes three pieces, which is our white glove OTC desk, uh, our wholesale liquidity, and market service. Um, the next one is our tokenization in an NFT platform, followed by our, by our smart wallet, and of course then, which I'm the GM of our digital asset exchange. And ultimately, our goal is to allow our clients and partners around the world to reimagine prosperity, where every asset and service is digital and accessible so that we can unlock financial services for the billions locked out and, of course, the billions locked in. We kind of coined the term everything digital. Thank you. Awesome. And then for Bitcoin SV dot exchange, I think it's a new name to most of us. Jacob, would you like to unveil what the project is about and uh, your plans for the exchange? Sure. So good morning. I'm Jacob Salk. I'm in Wilmington, North Carolina. So the Bitcoin SV exchange is a full exchange enabling the trading and tokenization of virtually any security all on the Bitcoin SV blockchain. Uh, we support all Bitcoin SV tokens, NFTs, and other securities. It's a global offshore exchange, uh, not for U.S. clients, and we anticipate doing the full launch by end of June. Uh, we have a partnership with Tokenize, which has built a great protocol on the Bitcoin SV network for transmission, authentication, and storage of data, um, which is the underpinning the platform. Uh, our main goal is to create a level and transparent playing field with real-time settlement and enable investors really to own the underlying assets that they're trading and not have them be in street name. Um, we've also leveraged the All5 Sigma backend, so between All5 and Tokenized, we can process a million uh, trades a second, scaling up to perhaps 5 million trades a second on the exchange. Um, brokers can execute trades for customers. Our fixed API allows broker-dealers to integrate internationally and route orders for clients. Uh, as well as other equity trading platforms. And essentially, we want to make full level two available to all players without market manipulation. Would the service offering be mostly focused on, you know, securities such as stocks that you mentioned or more in the uh, cryptocurrency space? Um, both. I mean, it's obviously we're based on Bitcoin SV, but um, the goal is to basically be a secondary market for uh, for shares uh, as well, in addition to tokenization of any asset on the Bitcoin SB blockchain. Good to know. Um, Roger, I, I think DLT Finance Group is mostly focused in the uh, institutional investor sector. Can you tell us more about uh, the service offerings and anything in relation to the Bitcoin SB? Yeah, exactly. So DLT is a prime broker. So our job is to connect the traditional asset world with the uh, new asset class. So our clients are banks and financial institutions, and we connect them to allow them to trade crypto assets and all kinds of stuff, but also tokenized equity, tokenized securities. And uh, we are Baffin regulated as well for the custody, so all our clients and banks can um, yeah, store their assets with us, and we allow them to get access to a new asset class. What types of uh, tokenized securities are you guys offering right now? And uh, what types of platforms? Well, actually, in, in Germany, we had a new law, so they are coming up um, debt, for example, so tokenized um, debt um, loans, which are the first uh, ones in the market. Um, in addition, I think in the near future, we will see tokenized equities, as we can see it already on uh, some crypto exchanges being listed. 
And uh, we are connected to the major exchanges, the crypto exchanges, especially this one uh, offering fiat access. And um, we can cover more or less everything which is listed on the exchanges. So we are not an exchange directly, so we don't have own products. But uh, we can facilitate all products which are listed on the different exchanges to allow our clients to invest in this. Very interesting. Um, Armin, can you describe what uh, PDXP is for those who haven't used it and uh, if you have any product updates? Uh, hi, Ella. Yeah, it's very good to be back on CoinGeek. And um, yeah, actually, TDXP is a trading app we launched around six months ago. And since then, uh, over 2,500, 2,050,000 2, trades have been executed uh, on uh, TDXP. Uh, last month's uh, total trading volume topped uh, up around 150 billion US dollars. And um, TDXP is actually is an amazing training app, very intuitive, very loved by its customers. And, um, uh, but it's on the surface, you know, and on the inside, the DNA of uh, TDXP, it is uh, very much aligned uh, with the values uh, of, of Bitcoin itself. Uh, you know, I think the core value of Bitcoin is that it cures mercantilism. You know, it cures addiction to power, it cures um, addiction to money. And, uh, uh, you know, we at uh, TDXP, uh, we are taking a different approach. Because the problem uh, with businesses, with ventures, is that they start with good uh, good things in mind, with willingness to make the world a better place to live. Uh, but when they grow, and if they grow big, uh, it all changes. They become a cash cow. And a blockchain native business like TDXP, uh, where business model is recorded on chain, all the cash flows are recorded on chain, you cannot change your values if and when you grow big. Uh, that's why we at TDXP, we plan to launch a loyalty program that will be directly correlated to the number of active traders. So the larger we grow, the more uh, will be the profit uh, we share with our customers. Uh, it, um, and you know, uh, we will not be able to change our business model, especially with the layer one technology that Attila Aros is now uh, developing. Uh, it will be also technically impossible. Um, when we scale beyond the ESV ecosystem, when we introduce USD back trading, it will make a lot of difference, I believe. Yeah, it's interesting that you touched upon the uh, royalty program, which a lot of exchanges implement. But with BSV, uh, which allows uh, micropayments, right? The, are, are you uh, deploying this on-chain using the micro-payments uh, capabilities? Yeah, for sure. This is the killer feature of uh, BSV. Uh, Nano-payments, uh, micro-payments. And uh, the beauty is that it is available right out of the box. You can, you know, as soon as you select BSV as the platform to build up your business, um, you and your customers will immediately enjoy the advantages of uh, micropayments capabilities. Awesome. Um, for Daniel and Jacob, both of your exchanges have a BSV focus in terms of supporting the uh, trading assets and trading pairs. So I'm curious to hear from you, why do you choose that focus? And why do you believe that BSV provides a good ledger for the future of tokenized assets? Obviously, for us, it's the high-speed, incredibly low transaction costs at you know a quarter of a penny, uh, as well as the heavily underutilized network. I think the last testing was done at 9,000 transactions a second, but the average on network right now is about four and a quarter. Um, but mainly for us, it was the the tokenized protocol being built on the Bitcoin SV blockchain, and uh, you know the commercial and trading applications given the transmission, authentication, and, and storage protocol. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer a little bit differently. Um, so I'm going to just give you kind of an a update of what we're really doing as a whole with the uh, Fabric Exchange, and then I'll show you how that we're working and integrating that with the BSV blockchain. So 
first of all, fabric exchange is fully regulated. So we're launching in the U.S., so we are going to be available to U.S. customers here in the next couple of weeks, uh, as well as we're uh, pursuing a MTF license over in Europe. Um, we are basically an enterprise-grade digital asset exchange. It was built from the ground up, not to just support spot crypto, but also derivatives and fractionalized shares, tokenized securities, things like tokenizing Apple or Amazon stocks or any of the newer STOs. Um, we're also going to be tokenizing real-world assets and things like commodities for art, real estate, collectibles. And again, it kind of plays on the whole bit where I said before is we believe in everything digital. So this is going to be an exchange truly for everything digital. And initially, our exchange will launch with an integrated wallet infrastructure. And this is kind of really kind of cool, right? So as you guys know, in centralized systems, everything is within the exchange, the wallet, the trading, all that, right? But after our launch, what we're planning to do is decouple the wallet and the order book um, to create a world-leading hybrid exchange. So it's not decentralized, but a hybrid exchange. In this unique hybrid exchange model, we take the best parts of the centralized order book, which, by the way, uh, our matching engine, we, we've uh, done a technology partnership with NASDAQ. Um, everybody knows who NASDAQ is. Um, so we're using their matching engine, and um, we've integrated this ecosystem for the wallets for decentralized docking, where the funds and the assets are kept in the user wallets and only locked and transferred in and out of the exchange during order placement execution. So the wallet aspect is very similar to decentralized, but yet you get all the speed and the execution of the centralized exchange when you're actually executing the trade, right? Um, so I think where we found is that this wallet or this model only really works as possible with the base layer technology of BSV due to its ability to massively scale why I'm continuing to low transactions fees, of course. So again, um, our exchange is currently launched internally, um, and then we're going to be launching to the public later this month. And uh, actually, just to point out is I want to let everyone know that's there physically. We are accepting a limited amount of early access registrations that are booth at CoinGeek, so come visit if you want to be one of the first. That's awesome. I think that would probably be the first uh, hybrid model where you incorporate a, a, a blockchain native wallet with uh, leveraging the benefits of having a centralized matching engine. That's definitely very re revolutionary. Yeah, that's, that's, that's correct. And actually, when you think about that model associated with you know, our qualified custody and our, our OTC desk capabilities, we really have the um, perfect ecosystem for any institutional or retail trader that really wants to uh, trade in the uh, Google space. Oh, safely and securely, regularly. Yep, for sure. Uh, Roger, uh, I know, you know, with DLT Finance Group focusing on the institutional investors in this area of uh, new asset class, you definitely have done a lot of consulting and education to those potential investors. I'm curious to hear from you, from your uh, experience, how has the institutional investors' view has kind of shifted towards digital assets over the year? Yeah, that's quite an interesting point. So looking back a little bit in history, I was before I started three years ago with DLT Group, uh, 22 years at Deutsche Bank trading derivative and equity. So as we started, uh, I went to my former colleagues and to my former clients. I went to Citigroup, to Goldman, to all the major, uh, um, the, all the major banks and asked them that we are building up a platform where they can trade crypto, Bitcoin especially. And yes, in case they were laughing about me and kicked me out of the door and told me next year Bitcoin will be dead. Um, times has changed. Um, so right now they come back and, and have so much pressure from their client side, especially if they even don't like Bitcoin as well. But now they feel the pressure and um, they need to be open to survive over the near decades in the future. And we see a lot of demand coming from the banks uh, in general, but as well asset managers, hedge funds, where they need to um, provide their clients a new asset class, a new way to invest. 
And uh, I think there's a growing demand, and it's not just uh, limited to Bitcoin or Ether or other tokens. Um, it's more the whole environment is changing. As we are speaking about NFTs, as we are speaking about security token, tokenized apt, uh, debt and, and art, and everything we have uh, here today as well in the, uh, in the conference. And uh, I think that will be a master change in the near future. And uh, banks which are not able to, to change their setup and change their mind, uh, they will be sooner or later um, getting out of the game. Yeah. How do they usually evaluate which types of digital assets to invest? Yeah, that, that's a bit of a problem. Um, it comes from the client demand. So if you're an asset manager and your client is asking you, okay, I want to not just put my money on, uh, on some loans where I don't receive any, uh, any interest rates, um, they have, everybody has equity on their portfolios and then now they are looking for alternatives. And I think that's uh, very much client driven. And on the other hand side, there are some um, activities in about uh, setting up new structures. So to tokenize equity, to tokenize loans, um, just to provide a different kind of service to their clients. Ella, can I just add one more thing here? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I come from actually the derivative space as well, and I've been in, in this since like 2014. Uh, and you know, I completely agree everything that's been said. The one. The one thing that I noticed in the institutional space is the difference between, say, three years ago and today, that when I when I talk to everyone, is the fact that there's a real custody solution now. Back then, it wasn't so strong, it wasn't regulated. You know, nobody wants to hold their own keys, right? And that was one of the biggest hurdles, you know, three years ago, uh, when, when institutional investors wanted to hold their you know, Bitcoin or any type of crypto, right? I mean, it's scary to hold literally millions or if not hundreds of millions or billions of dollars worth of crypto and you could potentially lose it. But now with all the really strong custodial, the, the regulations around it, again, we have our own custodial solutions for that. Um, I think that's what's really the big game changer. And look, the clients have always been asking for more uh, in, in investing, as as, as he point, pointed out. Um, but the, the point was, is they didn't have really, I think, a safe place to start, but now they do. And I think this is one of the big differences that we're seeing why institutions are starting to get into it. No, absolutely. Uh, that was exactly the reason why we also um, applied for a license for the custody and as well for the trading. As if you speak, for example, to Citigroup or a large bank, they are not allowed to trade against an unregulated exchange. And that's why right, that's also, right. as you mentioned, you applied for an MTF license. This will be something yep. which will be changing the whole environment in the near future. Yeah, to get access to the old money <laughs> needs uh, to be regulated. That's right. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, all of you guys are coming from the traditional finance world whether it's trading or asset management. So I'd like to change the gear a little bit and delve into the trading use case using blockchain. We've seen the Robinhood situation earlier this year during the GameStop trading frenzy. Uh, Robinhood had to shut down trading due to settlement issues with the clearing houses. So do you think that on-chain clearing and settlement of trades could potentially uh, solve such, such issues? I can start with that one. So I think the, that scenario highlights the fact that our capital markets are, are very broken um, and how market makers can really prevent proper order flow and by engaging in wash sales and illegal making short selling. Um, you know, the SEC implemented Reg SHO back in 2005, which was supposed to force folks to locate and close out um, but obviously that hasn't been very effective. The right show daily goes to you know, six billion in failures to deliver, which means that the average retail investor is up against significant uh, and often illegitimate market forces. Um, so putting this on the blockchain and tokenizing these securities on the ledger, I, we view as very, very beneficial. And basically instead of having all these unknowns and people plus three are going to a real uh, T plus zero, and one of the things that we intend to implement is posting all the trading information publicly, obviously anonymously, um, but at the end of the, each day, creating a daily published list of all trades so that people can see the efficacy. 
Um, so in, in summary, I think that there are a lot of a lot of benefits of of using blockchain and tokenizing, and uh, that we stand to actually make a dent in a lot of these serious issues, which are significantly hurting retail investors. I think if you see like gaming companies and and now you saw it a couple panels just before the e-gaming, they're settling a lot of things, whether it's trade of weapons or hands on poker or blackjack on the blockchain. It makes perfect sense for us to be settling all the trades around the world on, in a blockchain format. And specifically, obviously, again, DSD does have that scalability for it. Um, but I might challenge you whether or not uh, Robinhood really went down because of the the lack of the uh, clearing or if it was maybe pressure from one of their partners. It just feels like it was like a simple liquidity crunch. You know, in crypto space, it happens every second month or when they just go on maintenance all together simultaneously. Yeah, so essentially it means that uh, they just um, didn't want to pay the profits. Um, and uh, we need to put the data on chain. Yeah, we need to uh, change the, the approach, but I think it is a, quite a far-fetched goal. Um, and we need to negotiate with regulators heavily yeah, in order to achieve it. You know, at uh, TDXP, um, we, uh, we understood this problem since the very beginning, and that's why our liquidity is fully autonomous. It is uh, funded by the community, and uh, uh, we are not uh, we are independent. We are not a part of any liquidity group. Uh, and it means that we are, have no incentive, you know, to um, to health trading or our, our liquidity is fully transparent. You always know how much profit is available to take it. And uh, yeah, uh, it is the future on chain trading. Yeah, but uh, for institutional uh, brokers to follow this approach, we need to work with the regulator. So, in the case of TDXP, Sorry, just to dive into this a little bit deeper. Uh, curious to know which part of the, the trade goes on chain and which part goes off chain currently. Well, it is uh, reported on chain. Yeah, so the moment you open the trade, all the information is uh, stored on the public ledger. And um, I, I'd say that uh, it's fully, fully on chain. No, there's nothing happening uh, off-chain here. Yeah, the only uh, weakness uh, that will be mitigated uh, in the near future is that uh, we uh, hold the margin of the position in custody. Uh, but as I said, we are waiting for the layer one technology yeah, in order to uh, further decentralize uh, the whole process. I think one thing that's going to be really important is that the regulatory bodies, they buy into this system as well, right? Because right now they're so used to this centralized model where all the brokers or exchanges, they report their trades in a system that, that's already been used for, you know, decades, right? Um, but they're going to have to switch there as well. So, you know, one of the things I know we're, we're doing is we're, we're working very closely with uh, regulatory bodies, specifically in Europe. And, and helping them understand, you know, blockchain and technology, and how much more efficient it can be to be able to, you know, offer these types of services, allow these trades to be settling on chain rather than in a centralized environment at some point. But that's going to just take time, unfortunately. Yeah, it's, I think it's, that's exactly a very well uh, good point. If you combine, combine the traditional world, where you have uh, a system which had 50 years time to develop, with the new blockchain world, we are speaking about two, three, four years where everything has to be uh, put into the systems and I think it's a development. So it will take some time until also regulated exchanges as NASDAQ or CME, whatever, will have the possibility to trade on a 24-7 system. I mean, this is exactly also why, for example, uh, the problems with Robin Hood came from even if you are possible on a technical side to trade on a weekend the fiat money needs to come into the system as well. And as long as clearing houses and banks are not able to settle on a weekend, 
you are not able to bring fresh money. And you can see it very well, especially on exchanges which have fiat access, um, on long weekends or on, on Christmas or New Year's days. So they have uh, three or four days where no fresh money can come into the exchanges. So the liquidity is very much limited in this uh, moment. And you can see, in addition, crypto pairs trading on uh, US dollar um, stable coins, for example, Tether or USDC, have much more liquidity as they are very yeah, concentrated on the blockchain. So they can trade and uh, settle instantly and, and bring the funds to the certain wallets where they need to be uh, able to provide to have uh, efficient trading. But as you mentioned, it will take some time. Yeah. I'll take your point one step further. I think that in addition to those three points that you both raised, and, you know, the importance is what it sounds like we're all working on in various capacities is that we're really taking the, the asset out of street name and putting it into the investor name. Um, you know, I'm aware of numerous securities and cryptocurrencies that are tradable on Robinhood, for example, where you, you don't actually have the, the cryptocurrency in your own wallet, and it's just essentially held in the street name. Um, so I think getting off that model is very important in terms of security. Yeah, I think doing uh, tokenization, clearance settlement on chain definitely have a significant efficiency achieved in the trading process. Um, but also, I, I think there, uh, the point on blockchain and Bitcoin can also potentially bring new revenue streams or revolutionize uh, the trading business models. So I'm curious to hear, uh, you know, Army and Jacob, Daniel, you guys are developing on the Bitcoin SV blockchain. Um, how unique features of BSV, such as data capacity, uh, low fees, etc., can potentially change the ch uh, business model in the future? Yeah, uh, Armin, start? do you want to start? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, it all, everything you listed actually all comes down to scalability. And uh, one thing important to mention is that uh, you know, all other blockchains, they are now competing for thousands, ten thousands. They're theorizing uh, hundreds of thousands of transactions per second. But uh, it's, all, uh, it's all nothing, you know. Uh, you know it, uh, it is not worth building on a blockchain that has no probable roadmap to reach millions of transactions per second. Because just a few uh, popular apps uh, will already... Uh, already generate that amount of capacity. Uh, and, um, mm, you know, everything will change because of this. Um, especially, mm, especially the marketing strategy will also change because right now, as I previously mentioned with the lo loyalty token, yeah, you can interact with the customer on a daily basis. You can share your profits with him on uh, daily, hourly basis, you know, as, as frequently as you wish. Cool, yeah, definitely provides a good way to in, increase the uh, network effect and grow your communities and user base. Absolutely. Uh, Daniel. Um, you know, look, I, I, I think you said correctly that it's all about scalability and what can you ultimately build um, on these blockchain. You know, DeFi is a really, really big important space right now, and I think that's what I'm looking forward to seeing, what things can be built on top of, you know, the BSD blockchain, especially with all the scalability you hear. You know, there are things being built on, you know, DOT and, and uh, you know, Cardano and Ethereum and everything. Um, but still, I don't, it, it's not close to what the scalability BSD offers. So I'm really kind of interested to see what, what kind of comes out of there, and I'd love to see the community uh, put some more projects around that, and and uh, I think it's Arab Ventures can support some of those new products that uh, potentially could come out. Yeah, the banks are uh, really I agree. I'm, in the DeFi space, I think the ability to tokenize uh, balances and positions are a very powerful tool. Um, and I'm very interested to see who's going to uh, come up with new innovative models in the BSD space as well. You, you know what space I'm actually really excited about? The NFT space. Now, I know 
there's been a, a this kind of this big boom and sort of this relaxing atmosphere. I won't say bust, but more like a relaxed. But you know where, where I where I really see it changing quite a bit is 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 actually in the art world, and I've I kind of done a lot of uh, research and I talked to a lot of artists and everything, and I think. One of the coolest products about this is, is like in the music industry, when an artist creates a song, right? Every time it's played on the radio, they receive the royalties, right? But now what I'm starting to see is the, the, the uh, artists that are painters or sculptors, they can attach a physical with a digital, and then you put the two together, and they kind of move together. And it's more valuable if they are together, right? And then what happens is every single time that artwork is sold, that our original artists still always get a cut, very similar to the royalty that's happening in the music industry. And so I think that's like a really great example of how you know the, the whole crypto ecosystem is starting to change. You know, areas for um, you know just new lines of business or all the old world of uh, technology and just being able to bring it into a space that can, somebody can benefit from that they couldn't benefit from, uh, before. So it's really cool. I'm, I really like the NFT space. Jacob, how about you? Um, you know, again, for us, I think it's the verifying the legitimacy of trades, um, you know, making it so that there's no naked short selling, wash sales, um, really, really making sure that things are as they were intended to be, um, and creating a platform in which there can't be all the rampant market manipulation you see on a daily basis all the time. I think that's the, the larger thing for us. Thanks. Then for the Again, final couple... thoughts. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> I'm curious to hear from you guys. What are the areas in the digital assets trading space that you think still have a lot of untapped opportunities that you're very excited about? It can be you know, any new asset class, financial primitives, or a uh, new way to reconstruct the stack. Uh, let's go with you, NFT. Jacob. <laughs> NFT. Uh, I'm, I'm, certainly, I'm certainly very excited and curious to see where things go with NFTs. Obviously, art, uh, music, publishing rights, uh, artist rights are all very important things. Um, so I think that the, the entertainment space and, and intellectual property is certainly something that we're, we're very curious to see where it goes. Yeah, I think it will also change the existing environment which we have, for example, in trading equities or other traditional asset classes. If you move it out to a, a new way of trading that you are able to trade uh, tokenized equity on a 24-7 basis, a lot of uh, companies which stay on the situation where they need to decide do I want to make an IPO or an ICO, they have different opportunities now. So do you want to limit yourself to be listed only on one exchange and trading mm -hmm. only from 9 to 5? Or do you want to have a possibility to get access for your clients on a 24-7 basis without any holidays or weekends? Daniel, NFT plus financing NFTs? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I look, I, look, at the end of the day, I really like also what we're doing with the uh, exchange in terms of this hybrid model. As you pointed out, it'll be the first of its kind. And uh, again, it's about bridging that old world with the new world. And we just have to do it step by step. You know, We got to get the regulatory um, buy-in. We got to get the central bank buy-in. Um, so there's, a, there's still a long road ahead, but slowly and surely, the pieces are falling into place and uh, it'll, it'll come full circle. Armin, what are you excited about yeah. most? Right, I am very excited about CFDs, yeah, and uh, our project is revolutionizing and disrupting the CFD space as we speak. But, uh, overall, every asset will be digitized, yeah, and uh, there will be no distinction, you know, between digital assets and traditional assets eventually. And the composability of deploying it on blockchain. Everything goes right. right. Thanks, sir. <laughs> Thanks very much for the great discussion, gentlemen. And I'm looking yeah. forward to trying out the uh, new Fabric Exchange at BitcoinSV.com Exchange. BitcoinSV.Exchange. BitcoinSV.Exchange. <laughs> All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Data is double-edged. 
wield it well and build your place in tomorrow. But trust it blindly and risk watching your progress crumble. Because much of the data we rely upon isn't reliable at all. At Enchain, we believe in data, but we put no faith in it. Instead, we build tools that enable enterprises to trust the data upon which they rely. Enchain. Data without question.